on today's show. Thor Industries debuts a self-powered all-electric Airstream concept that's designed specifically to be towed behind an EV. Swedish Kenyan firm Opibus debuts the first electric bus to be designed and built in Africa. And a Kiwi firm says it's developing new liquid-cooled battery packs for the Nissan Leaf. These stories and more coming next. This is Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup show from New Zealand's only Carbon Zero certified renewable electricity company. We only source from wind, hydro and solar and we are the leading supplier of electricity to electric vehicles in New Zealand. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Welcome back to another roundup in the world of clean cars and green energy. We've got some great stories lined up for today, including two very important local Kiwi ones. This week in Florida, the state held its annual RV Super Show. Among all of the usual debuts of new camping trailers, caravans and RVs, we saw some electric models grab the limelight, including the Winnebago ERV concept, which we covered earlier in the week. Thor Industries, the company that owns the Airstream Mark, had two electric concepts in attendance. The first, the Thor Vision vehicle, was built on a custom chassis developed with Roche and promises a range of up to 300 miles, 482 kilometers, thanks to a large set of batteries and a hydrogen fuel cell range extender. But what really got us excited was the E-Stream, a concept Airstream with its own electric drivetrain and battery pack. The trailer is not only capable of performing low-speed manoeuvres without a car attached, but its twin-motor 242 horsepower, 178 kilowatt drivetrain and 80 kilowatt hour battery pack means that it can help pull itself along without draining the battery packs of the EV towing it. This is a true game-changer and I hope it makes it into production. Volkswagen has been teasing us with videos of the Volkswagen ID Buzz in development this week, showcasing a stream of pre-production ID Buzz vans coming off the production line at its Hanover plant in Germany. Because the vehicle won't get its official reveal until March 9th, that means for now all of these pre-production vehicles are wearing special camouflage wraps. But as eagle-eyed folks watching might note, the vehicles shown coming off the production line in Volkswagen's teaser appear to have different configurations. One ID Buzz appears to have one rear sliding door, while another has two, which hints at different trim levels and options at launch. Volkswagen says these pre-production vehicles will take part in the brand's first ID Buzz Media Drive event next week, a so-called covered drive event. Their select journalists will be able to give their driving impressions, but don't expect full specs to be released until the reveal event in March. And no, we're not going. Sad face. As it prepares to report its Q4 and calendar 21 financials on February 3rd, Ford has issued a statement outlining several large special items that have affected its financials last quarter. Among them, its $8.2 billion gain on the $1.2 billion equity investment it made in EV startup Rivian in 2019. Rivian, which underwent its IPO at the end of last year, was briefly worth more than Ford by market cap, topping $100 billion at its peak. Ford also recently hit a $100 billion valuation and is now worth more than Rivian again. But Ford's gain in worth from its investment in the company is great news for Ford as it struggles to keep up with demand for its F-150 Lightning. Simply put, while Ford doesn't intend to build an EV with Rivian anymore, it doesn't look like it's going to divest anytime soon. And the value of its 12% shareholding in Rivian is a great way to help it secure extra funds as and when required. Shrewd. At the tail end of last week, Tesla quietly increased the price of buying its full self-driving package. While every Tesla will come from the factory with Tesla's autopilot as standard, which includes Tesla's active safety features, those who want to have their cars drive themselves when Tesla flips the switch on full self-driving will now have to pay $12,000 on top of the price of their car at point of purchase. This is a full $2,000 more expensive than FSD was last year and a full $4,000 over the original $8,000 price. As I'm sure you know, FSD is currently not enabled, so customers are paying in advance for a future feature. That said, if you have paid for FSD and have a high enough safety score, you can at least access Tesla's FSD beta program. 
As with previous FSD pricing, Tesla also offers the chance of a monthly subscription of $99 a month for owners with enhanced autopilot already active in their cars. Those without will have to pay $199 a month, which frankly is quite a lot of money. General Motors has come under a lot of criticism recently for its handling of the Bolt battery recall, statements made by its CEO Mary Barra about leading the EV revolution and the low EV sales figures it had at the tail end of last year, which were in turn caused by the Bolt battery recall. This week, though, Mark Royce, president at General Motors, gave some hope that things are changing, noting that the first pre-production Cadillac Lyric cars are now rolling off the production line at its Spring Hill production facility. For any automaker, getting pre-production vehicles successfully made using production tooling is a big deal, as it suggests series production is just a few months away. For those who have a Lyric reservation, this is great news, although, like most legacy automakers right now, GM is constrained by its battery supply. Like the Hummer EV and recently announced Silverado EV, the Lyric makes use of GM's Ultium batteries, and GM's first Ultium battery production facility in Lordstown, Ohio, has only just recently finished construction. As one of the world's leading crash test experts, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's crash test ratings are a must consult for anyone looking to buy a new car. Constantly evolving as automotive safety improves, the IIHS rating system really lets you know how your car will protect you in a collision. This week, the organization announced a brand new ratings program to help rank the partly autonomous driver assistance systems that are now coming to market. But rather than evaluate the system's capabilities in supervised driving environments, the IIHS is focusing on how the systems can keep the driver alert and ready to take over. Its argument is, and I'm paraphrasing here, that while it's great that cars can partly drive themselves, it's no good if those not fully autonomous systems suck at telling you it's time to take back over control. In order to earn a good score, the IIHS will look for systems that can't easily be cheated and ensures that the driver has their hands on the wheel and or that they're looking at the road ahead and able to take over at a moment's notice. As one of the smallest and most affordable highway-capable electric cars that you could buy in Europe, the diminutive Volkswagen E-Up and its rebadged siblings was the perfect city runabout for many people. The most recent variant, with decent range and DC quick charging, was in so much demand that when Volkswagen cancelled the model in 2020, there was more than a year's worth of back orders to fulfil. Rumours at the time suggested that the E-Up was too expensive for Volkswagen to produce, hence its cancellation. But now newspaper reports are suggesting that Volkswagen is about to relaunch the E-Up, with plans to keep it in production until 2025, when the ID Life, a more affordable ID vehicle than the ID3, with a similar size to the E-Up, is expected to go on sale. While Volkswagen hasn't officially confirmed this rumour, some dealerships in Germany are already taking deposits. Apparently. If you've been following this channel for a while, you'll know that we've been eagerly following Opibus, a Swedish-Kenyan company that's been working hard to electrify sub-Saharan Africa with both electric vehicles and energy storage products. We've already covered its electric safari vehicles and electric motorcycles, as well as the company's continued success in funding. It's currently the most funded African electric mobility company to date. This week, Opibus unveiled its latest project, Kenya's first all-electric bus, a bus that all also happens to be the first all-electric bus to be designed and built in Africa for use in Africa. Based on Opibus's modular battery pack and drivetrain system, the bus will soon enter into service as part of a trial program in the peri-urban areas surrounding Kenya's capital city of Nairobi. Ten buses in total will join it on its commercial test route by the second half of this year, and Opibus is hoping to bring its electric buses into series production next. While it happened late last year, we learned this week that a driver who failed to take over control of his Tesla car and ran a red light, killing two people in the process, was charged with two counts of vehicular manslaughter in California. The case is the first of its kind, and although inaccurate media reporting has at times intentionally or unintentionally laid the blame at the feet of Tesla's semi-autonomous driver assistance system, this tragedy is sadly a prime example 
of autopilot abuse. While Tesla's full self-driving beta system, a software that still requires driver supervision, can detect and react to traffic signals, vanilla autopilot does not, something Tesla tells its customers quite clearly via disclaimer screens. Thus, when the car in question came across a red light while in autopilot mode and the driver did not intervene, it continued through the intersection, hitting another car and killing two of its occupants. The defendant, Kevin George Aziz Riyad, pleaded not guilty in a court hearing in October and is currently free on bail. The preliminary hearing for the case is scheduled for February 23rd. While this is not Tesla's fault, it does, yet again, bring up the need for standardization, and driver testing when it comes to semi-autonomous driving systems. One of the challenges of the modern EV world is that when new cars are launched, you don't always get to see them launch in all markets at the same time. And if you're in a right-hand drive market like New Zealand, it sometimes means that the wait is longer than it is for those in left-hand drive markets. But if you're waiting for news of the Kia EV6 in New Zealand, I've got some fabulous news, specifically that Kia New Zealand is finally getting ready to launch the EV6 for Kiwi customers. The EV6 will launch with a choice of all-wheel or rear-wheel drive and a choice of 58 or 77 kilowatt-hour battery pack. This means a wider choice for customers, and that means you're more likely to find an EV6 that suits your needs or your pocketbook. The EV6 Air rear-wheel drive long range will get a range of 528 kilometers per charge, while the all-wheel drive variants will do 506 kilometers. And with rapid charging networks like ChargeNet supporting the EV6's high voltage rapid charging, expect a refill to take place in less time than it takes you to grab a quick bite to eat. Keep your eyes peeled and hopefully we'll get a chance to test drive one very soon. Here's a question for you. If you had an electric car record to set, which one would you attempt? I guess your answer would depend on the kind of person you are and if you're willing to go ahead with the very commercialized way in which the Guinness Book of World Records conducts itself. But earlier this year, a team of drivers set a new world record we never thought of, the greatest altitude change ever achieved by an electric car in a single day. At the wheel of a Porsche Taycan Cross Turismo, the team drove more than 1,400 miles, 2,250 kilometers, in a single day, going from the lowest point in North America above ground, that's Badwater Basin and Death Valley, to the lowest point of Eagle Mine in Michigan, before then driving to the top of Pikes Peak in Colorado. It's certainly a unique and different record, and because you'd need a new mineshaft or higher mountain to climb, it's unlikely to get broken anytime soon. So I guess congratulations are in order? And finally, as one of the earliest mass-produced electric vehicles, the Nissan LEAF has a loyal fan base. And as a former owner of not one but two LEAFs, I've got to admit, I have a soft spot for them. However, particularly in markets outside Europe and the US, owners have consistently reported that Nissan has not got the owners in mind when it comes to replacement battery packs, with some people in some countries finding it so hard to buy replacement battery packs for their cars that they've been forced to carry out extreme measures, like converting a Nissan LEAF to an internal combustion car. That's in Sri Lanka. And because the Nissan LEAF lacks active cooling, which combined with older chemistries, has suffered the most when it comes to premature aging of those early battery packs, people have been in trouble. While we've seen companies retrofitting new larger capacity packs, New Zealand company EVs Enhanced has just announced it will soon start building entirely new battery packs with integrated cooling and a variety of chemistries available for customers to put in their cars. New Zealand has a healthy grey market of older right-hand drive Japanese leaf imports, and this could really help keep them on the road for years to come. We cannot wait to see how they perform, and we want to go visit. And on that note, we are done for the day. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next episode. And if you haven't already switched, why not switch to New Zealand's only Carbon Zero certified renewable electricity company? It is super easy to make the switch. And when you do, you'll help New Zealand wean itself off dirty energy and onto clean green power to keep the land beautiful for generations to come. We'll be back next week with more awesome content. But until then, enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. Kakite. See you next time.